Good morning, class. This is Jeff Mole. I am today uh, going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 through 16. Before we get started, I'd like to pray. Father, this is your word. As we open up your word, I pray you bless the reading and the teaching of your word. Speak to us by your spirit. Change us and transform us in mind and in faith. I pray all this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. So we are now in chapter 7 of our study of 1 Corinthians. And once again, we are addressing sexuality. In chapter 5, we address sexual immorality as a moral problem and how they were tolerating a type of sexual immorality that was not even tolerated even among the pagans. Paul stated that they were arrogant about it. And in verse 2 of chapter 5, rather than mourning over the sinful behavior, it was staining publicly the testimony of that church. Verse 6 suggests that they were not only tolerating it, but they were boasting about their tolerance of this behavior. Paul instructed them to cleanse the old leaven and to put that sexually immoral man out of the church before that man's immorality leavens the whole church. Their tolerance of his sin was not unlike what we're seeing today when entire denominations are openly affirming sexual immorality and are celebrating it. The term sexual immorality does not just refer to same-sex relations, but any and all forms of sexual immorality which exist outside the boundaries of a marriage covenant. This is a significant problem, and as we discussed last week, The culture is in the middle of a moral and sexual revolution that's evolving at an exponential pace. And with this respect, the culture is moving further and further away from a biblical view on sexuality, and we need to be prepared to stand firm in our convictions. Last week, we looked at chapter 6, and we discussed how sexual immorality was a theological problem. We discussed how the Christian is redeemed not only spiritually, but in body as well. And my central focus last week was on how Christians who identify with Christ and His resurrection are walking in newness of life. Through our obedience, we give testimony to the world that the gospel has both a redemptive effect on the soul and the body. This week we're discussing sexuality within the marriage covenant and the blessings that come with a healthy sexuality within marriage. We'll also begin to discuss the benefits of remaining single as it pertains to Christian devotion to the Lord. So let's go ahead and read the text beginning at verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation To sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. And the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should not marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, not I, uh, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband 
who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you, you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? I pray that God would bless the reading of His Word. Uh, so, beginning at verse 1. We see these Corinthians had um, written Paul a letter and were obviously confused about the role of sexuality in a Christian's life. And are here Paul is addressing uh, their letter uh, and he's responding to their concerns. We see here in this passage that they were, there were some um, within the church that were advocating for celibacy to have a total devotion to Christ, and others were calling for the unyoked couples to split. There were apparently even some within the marriage covenant who had different views on the subject and were depriving one another of of physical intimacy. These believers were taking um, an aesthetic view and advocating abstaining altogether, and others were saying that marriage is no longer necessary And they were arguing for a divorce for spiritual reasons so that they can give total devotion to the Lord and His ministry. Notice the quotations in verse 1 where it says, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now this is not a quote from Paul. Uh, This is a question that they have to Paul. And obviously there were some who were taking the opposite position as those in chapter 6 who were rationalizing their sexual sin by appealing to Christian liberty and arguing that the body has natural desires that must be fulfilled like the hunger must be satisfied by eating. As you remember in chapter 6, some were saying, all things are lawful for me and food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And once again, we see that they're confused about the role of sexuality in a Christian's life. The problem with their position is obvious, and Paul points it out. What do I do with this sexual drive within me? Notice what Paul says here in verse 2. Let's look at verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Paul uh, answers their question and points to the temptations of sexual drive that exist within the flesh. He says, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each person should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Paul is saying, for the sake of your purity, it is better for some to get married so that they may not be overcome by the desires of the flesh. And sexuality within the boundaries of marriage has within it blessings that God has given to the married couples as a gift. As you remember last week, we discussed that sex is a sacred act between the husband and the wife. And every time they experience this God's gift together, it's like the renewing of their covenant with one another. In chapter 6, Paul quotes Genesis 2 in stating, the two become one flesh, and then goes on to mirror our union with our spouse, with our union with Christ. The physical union is a blessed part of the marriage, and is a vehicle for the expression of that love. It says to one another, I am totally and exclusively yours bodily and spiritually. Verse 3 through 5, it says the husband should not, uh, should give to his, pardon me, let's start over. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 6, 
Now, this is not instruction that a spouse can use as a baseball bat to abuse the other spouse. Once again, Paul gives instruction in verse 5 that Satan can use celibacy to tempt someone to sexual immorality. Once again, this verse points back to his original point in verse 2 that because of the temptation to sexual immorality. Notice here in verse 6, Paul inserts his own counsel into the matter, but remember that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness. Paul's statement here is not a disclaimer, but rather he's giving godly wisdom on the matter for which the Lord has not spoken previously. Then he states here in verse 7 that he wishes everyone was single like him, but states each one has their own gift from God. Marriage and singleness are both gifts from God. Two weeks from now we'll hear um, from the end of this chapter, how Paul's argument for the reasons that he states he wishes we were single like him. Now, why would Paul say it's better for them to remain single? There could be multiple reasons we could speculate, but that at the end of this chapter, Paul is going to argue one who is single has an undivided heart versus the one who is married has a divided heart. An unmarried person has the ability to give their whole heart to ministry and serving the Lord. They have a freedom to make decisions and navigate ministry without a spouse. A married person has a ministry at home with his spouse and children, and a married person has anxiety about the health and safety of his family, whereas an unmarried person would not carry the same burden. Because of the price to be a Christian in this culture, it would affect not only one, but the entire family. Again, this will be explained in more detail in two weeks. Look here in verse 9. The issue of self-control comes up again. Look at verse 9. It says, But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. If they don't have the gift of self-control... They should marry so that the temptation and the drive of the flesh, as Paul argues in, chapter, in verse 2, does not remain as an ongoing struggle. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. There are some content to remain single. And again, as it says in verse 7, this also is a gift from God. In verse 10 through 11, Paul points back to his original point that some were attempting to divorce their spouse for spiritual reasons because they had believed that they would give total devotion to the Lord in His ministry. To them, instructs them not to separate. However, if the wife separates from the husband, she should not remarry and stay single so as not to commit adultery. The husband is told he should not divorce his wife. In Mark 10, Jesus gives us instruction about divorce. He says, What God has joined together, let not man separate. And whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and, and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount that whoever divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In verse 12 through 14, he says, To the rest I say, not I, the, uh, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Paul's now going to address the issue of unyoked married couples. Paul here is saying that God still sees marriage, even with the unyoked uh, unbelievers and believers, as sacred. Paul is saying that the unbelieving spouse 
does not defile the believing spouse. Rather, the believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse. Paul's not saying that the the whole household is saved by the salvation of one, but he's saying the whole household receives the covenant blessings because of their affiliation with the believing spouse. Look at verse 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. He says, However, if the unbelieving spouse can no longer dwell with the believing spouse and leaves, then by their abandonment of the marriage, the believing spouse is no longer bound by the original marriage contract and has the freedom to remarry. Notice God desires that the unyoked married couples live in peace rather than in constant strife. He makes a point here in verse 16. He says, For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? I can personally attest to this. My wife and I were saved later in life. I've been a Christian now for 16 years. 16 years this week. She was saved a year before me. And I know that I was a difficult person to live with because I was lost. But God in His timing opened my eyes to give me sight and caused me to be born again. And our marriage is stronger with every year. Marriage is a role play of the relationship to Christ and His church. He chose us purchased our redemption, gave us life within and a new heart. And now we're betrothed to Christ and He has given us the seal of His promise to us, the Holy Spirit. And He has said, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to Myself that where I am, you may be also. In the Old Testament, the husband would come to the wife and betroth her. And he would go and prepare a place. And then when the bridegroom was ready, he would come and they would celebrate and consummate the marriage. The Lord is coming again in order that our union may be made complete. Do you look forward to His coming again? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we know that You are coming again. You are coming again to take us that we may be where You are. We know, Lord Jesus, that You are faithful and true. We know, Lord Jesus, that You are going to bring judgment on the earth. We pray to give thanks for the redemption that comes through Your shed blood. We pray, Lord Jesus, that while we are here, that we would be fruitful in ministry and obedient, and that we would be acting in a manner and walking in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.